Several years ago, Dr. Harold Wolf from Cornell University Medical School did an extensive study. His study involved 25,000 United States soldiers who fought during World War II. Many prisoners during that awful time died and they became sick under the terrible conditions being a prisoner of war, inhumane treatment and forced labor. But strangely enough, Dr. Wolf discovered a few of those who showed only a slight physical change during their nightmarish months in prison. What made the difference between those thousands who were so defeated and malnourished and psychologically defeated and physically defeated and those few who were able to withstand that torturous treatment in a prison camp in World War II? What makes the difference between those who who were able to strive and hold on and those who capitulated and just didn't make it very well. Well, what made the difference? Dr. Wolf discovered an above average ability to hope, to hope. The men who had hope survived and were healthy. They were looking forward to, they were planning for something in the future that they expected to take place when they got out. Dr. Wolf concluded that when a person has hope, he is capable of incredible burdens to, to bear them and to, have, to, to endure in unbelievably cruel, cruel punishment. But when that man didn't have any hope, he simply could not survive. You know, uh, we have to have hope for tomorrow. There's not a person in this room who doesn't have something heavy on his or her heart or those of you worshiping online. There's something heavy on every heart who hears my voice. We have to have hope. We have to have hope because hope gives us courage. Hope gives us strength. Hope gives us the will and the ability to take one more step even when life feels heavy. We have to know a better day is ahead or we're gonna give up. You know, what oxygen is to the lungs, what blood is to the heart, what food is to the body, what water is to a tree, what gasoline or electricity is to an automobile, so is hope to the human heart. It is an incredible thing that keeps us going. Hope. Today's message, if you're taking notes or following on our app, it is hold on to hope. Hold on to hope. When all else fails, hold on to hope. A remarkable contribution of our relationship with Jesus Christ is hope. These six who were publicly baptized, they're holding on to Christ, which gives them hope. This one who in the next service will be baptized, holding on to hope. This hope is based in what Jesus did, lived a perfect life, died a sinless death, rose on the third day, and there's an empty tomb to prove that we have hope of a better day. Revelation 21, if you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation 21. And I wanna read some scripture there. It points to what God will do for us in the future in heaven. Heaven gives us hope. We have hope for then and we have hope for now. Revelation 21, if you've got, Revelation, if you're new to the Bible, it's the last book. There's 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, written over a span of probably 14, 1,500 years. I'm sure somebody will correct me. Lots of authors inspired by the Spirit of the living God. The Bible is inerrant. That means without error. It is inerrant, no error. What we have to be sure to guard against is that we can never think our interpretation of the Bible is inerrant without error because we're not inerrant beings. God's word's inerrant and we pray for wisdom to discern as God teaches us. So if you got Revelation 21, say got it. Here we go. If you don't have a Bible, then you can follow along with a neighbor. Verse one, Revelation 21. John, the apostle John on the Isle of Patmos wrote this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away. There were no longer, there was no longer any sea. Interesting statement, we'll come back to that. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Verse three, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he dwelt with them. And they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
There will no longer be any death, nor mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He was seated. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this and I will be their God and they will be my children. Father, today, would you take the reading of your word and the teaching of your word, would you by your Holy Spirit illumine our eyes and our hearts and our spirits to receive a word from you about hope today? And God, we pray that all who have suffered tragedy and discomfort and burdensome life trials, God, that today their hope would be renewed by your spirit, by the word of God. And we trust you today to work. Fill me, fill my mind, my mouth with your thoughts, your words. Holy God, Holy Spirit, fill me right now for this privilege to teach your word, to preach your word. I trust you and I thank you for filling me for this time of preaching. In Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. Amen. Jay, Jay, would you grab me a cough drop right under the front row and bring it to me, please, sir? Thank you. Let's look at Revelation 21, verse 6, as we start. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. First thing I want to do as we look at Revelation 21 is I want us to have our hope identified, our hope identified so we don't miss that. That's important. It's identified in Christ, the Alpha and the Omega. Hope is essential to our survival. You and I cannot go on without hope. But how can we hope in a world like ours? We live in a world that seems to be shattering and disintegrating and morals are just slipping into the the cesspools of life. You know, a business executive told his psychiatrist the other day, I've been coping with life for 40 years and I've run out of hope. I've been coping with life. It's hard to cope with life. Life is not easy. If your life is easy, you just hadn't lived long enough. It really, if your life is easy, you just haven't lived long enough. A mother, a mother of four preschoolers, she said, my cup, my cope, my cope runneth over. <laughs> I'm out, I'm out of cope. You know, we all know that feeling. How can we have hope today? What is the basis of our hope? We can't put our hope in circumstances because our circumstances are so uncertain. We can't put our hope in financial status because that can swiftly change with the stock market. We can't put our hope in the things of this world because they will often fail us. We cannot put our hope in people for even those we think love us sometimes let us down. As our eyes survey today's world, the question erupts in our soul, can we have hope in a world like ours? And yes, we can. We can't cope without hope. Cope is is defined as to deal effectively with something difficult. The only way you can deal effectively with something difficult is to have hope. The first century Christians living under Roman persecution must have voiced the same urgent appeal. How do they have hope? John began Revelation 21 by identifying our hope. John said quite plainly, our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is in God. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last letters in the Greek alphabet, as you know. I'm the beginning and the end. Let's look at that verse. Beginning, that word beginning, arche in the Greek. It's not just first in a series. Let me tell you, it rather means first in source, our origin from which all else comes. There's a difference. You see, our source is in God. Our source isn't in this world. He says, when you struggle, when you feel at loss, he says, go back to the beginning. Friends, if you and I could ever really grasp just four words in the Bible, and they're not from the New Testament, they're in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God, that's our source, that's our hope. If you believe in the beginning, God, then you can believe everything else. In the beginning, God, that's our source, number one. And then in, telos, 
It's not just the end, but it's the consummation or the goal, the goal of, of all things. And the consummation of, of life is not whatever you and I achieve here. The consummation of life is that one day we're gonna be in eternity with God to the glory of God. John was identifying our hope. Our our hope's not rooted in man, but in God. Our hope's not based on man's faithfulness. Our hope's based on God's faithfulness. Even when I'm faithless, he's faithful. Isn't that beautiful, church? See, even when I'm not pursuing him, he's pursuing me. Thank you, Jesus. Our hope is God-grounded, God-sustained, God-directed. If we put our hope in anything else, we got a problem. It's all sinking sand, right? But if we put our hope in God, our grand future is final, certain, and assumed. John's John's not writing as if it's not gonna happen. He's writing as if it's already happened. It just hasn't come in yet. It's hard for you and I to get that, though. Because you and I are so stuck in this little dot on this continuum of time that goes eternally past to the past and eternally to the future. And we got this dot, if we're blessed, four score. And I got three of those already used up. And we're so stuck in that dot, we don't understand. You are not a physical being with a soul and spirit. You are a spiritual being with a body. We live as if this world is all there is. If it is, sadness ought to be on us. This world is simply a launching pad into God's best for us, into eternity. The identification of our hope is Christ. He holds us now and forever. Let's look at some explanation. Our hope explained, John goes on. After identifying our hope, John explains our hope and gives a few details. And we have hope not, not because of of who holds the future, but because of what holds the future. There's there's two things. We know God has it, and then God's giving it. God's not reluctant to give us the best, but let's look. Here's here's a few things maybe you've not studied before, or if you have, maybe this will be review for you. Some of you are scholars in Revelation. I'm not there because I'm not too smart, and it's pretty complicated. Let's look at verse one. A new heaven and a new earth... The first heaven, first earth passed away. And then, not many people talk about this. There was no longer any sea, no longer any ocean. What does that mean? What's John saying? Well, let's look at John in his day. John in his circumstance. John in in his world. The sea represented various things. The ocean represented danger without modern navigation. Man feared the sea. In ancient times, the sea was considered evil because it supposedly was the abode or the living place of dragons and evil monsters. John's point was that in heaven, there, heaven contains nothing to be frightened of. To, 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 where was John? Shout it out, where was John? The Isle of Patmos. Some of you may have been there in the Mediterranean. He's he's all by himself. He's separated from those whom he loves. The sea represented something that separates him from life as he knew it. He's by himself on this island. John's exiled. He, He could look, he could see the mainland, but he couldn't get there. He could see the mainland, but those who were there could not get to him. He's by himself. The sea represents something that separated John. Friends, I'm telling you that anything that that separates you from what you need and, and the love of God, that's all gone in heaven. John says there's no more sea to separate us in any way. Nothing's gonna separate us from the love of God. No sea. Now, here's something that we do talk about and we do love, and it's worth talking about again. There'll be no more tears. How many tears have we shed in our lifetime? Cannot be counted. He says in verse four, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Our eyes, there'll be no more tears because there'll be no more death. There'll be no more mourning. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more pain for the older things have passed away. Those painful things of earth are no longer. 
Tears, what do they symbolize? They symbolize suffering, heartache, distress, struggle, burdens. In heaven, those don't exist. No suffering, no sorrow, no pain, no death. Just think, the ground will never taste the blood of a man. No fighting, no war. The earth will never be moistened by the showers of human tears. Tears are no more. Interesting, there'll be no more temple. Look at verse 22. Let's just take a little study there. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The temple was the place to meet God. The church is the place to meet God among other places. In heaven, you're always in the presence of God. You're always in a worship service. No need for worship at 9, 30, and 11, but worship will be continuous. No temples needed when we're always in the presence of God. Here's one, there'll be no night. N-I-G-H-T, Revelation 21, 25. On no day will its gates ever be shut and there will be no night there. Now that's an interesting phrase, no night there. Darkness stands for what? Evil. Darkness stands for the unknown. Darkness makes us nervous. Some, some kids and maybe even adults have a little fear of the dark. Why, why do we put a night light in the room of our children? Because they don't know what they can't see. In heaven, there'll be no darkness. Everything will be seen. See, the light of Christ will brighten all of heaven for all eternity. There's never a night in heaven. Only the light of earth. That's why John could write a message of hope to us. There's no separation and there's no night. No sorrow of broken hearts. No, no more sin to burden us with guilt. For our hope, when it is realized, that shatters all the hurts of the human heart. In heaven, we're always on the first day. If you've ever heard me speak at a funeral service, you've probably heard me say something like this. Is, is we, we think, oh my goodness, you know, I, I, I lost my grandmother, I lost my spouse, and, and I wonder if they're gonna miss me. Because what if I live another 30 years? What if I live another 20 years? What if I live another 40 years? Boy, that's so much time. They're gonna miss me. L ladies and gentlemen, they're not gonna miss you because in heaven there's no time. They're not gonna miss you because there's no night, which means there's only the first day. So when you get to heaven, it'll be just like they got there. You, now, we can't understand that because time is such a huge concept for us because we're locked into time because you hope I don't preach past the appointed hour because you got a brunch to go to. You've already watched. You've already looking at your phone to see what time it is. In heaven, there'll be no iPhones. Praise God. <laughs> Listen to me. It's just the first day. It's just, it's always. Don't you miss that? Because those of those, those of whom you love who have died, your mom, your dad, your grandparents, your spouse, they're already there. Some of us have brothers. I have brothers there. I have nephews there that I preach their funeral. My own brother, my own parents, my own ne two nephews. And it'll be just like, hey, I got here this morning. You got here in time for lunch. That's what it's going to be like. And we're, we, we will have lunch, by the way. You think, you, oh my gosh. You think we're not going to eat in heaven? You have lost your mind. That's going to be some of the fun stuff. I'm not kidding. I'm talking about the Bible here in a minute. We'll eat. In heaven, we're always on the first day because there's no night in heaven. Now, John gives us a, a more positive word. Let's look at this thought right here. He tells us not only what won't be in heaven, which is some good things, no tears and no sorrow, no night, that's all good, but he tells us what will be there. You have to look a little deeper. You have to, you have to dig a little bit and chew down a little bit, but, but we can expect protection Sometimes we feel vulnerable on this earth. There won't be any vulnerability in heaven. We can expect protection. If you're still in Revelation 21, go to verse 12. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, 12 angels at the gates, and on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. We can expect protection. Nothing is ever gonna penetrate or bother you in heaven. Never again will you be assaulted by anything in heaven in any way. You're protected. What else can you expect? You can expect participation. 
Ladies and gentlemen, if, if Baron or Sam or Terry or Angela or Tom or Leanne or any of our staff, our pastoral staff could, you know, there's a lot of things we could wish for and pray for, and we do. One of them is that nobody at TSC be a spectator. We want you to move from being a spectator to be a participator. We want you to get out of the stands and quit watching the game and not just be on the sideline down close to him. We want you to be in the game because what we play for is the most important thing in all of eternity and that is the souls of men and women. Jesus changes everything in every human heart and we want everybody to have Jesus because we have Jesus and Christ is the most important thing you have. Let's give him away to everybody else. We want you to participate. Well, you'll participate in heaven. We want you to participate on earth. Uh, you, let me give you some verses. You know what we're gonna do in heaven and we all think about this and so I'll address it first. We're gonna worship in heaven. So if you don't like it down here, then you just better, you better get ready because you're gonna spend a lot of time in heaven. So you might as well practice down here. That's why I mentioned before we bore this message. Look at Revelation 7. Go back 14 chapters. Golly, I'm smart. That Dixon math was good. I went there. I, that's not in my notes. I just did that off the top of my head. <laughs> Dang. Got good teachers in Dixon. I only say that because people that drive over from Dixon always get on me when I make fun of my hometown, so I got to say something positive. I'm not sure I really mean it, though. <laughs> I only got into Belmont because my dad was a trustee. <laughs> All right, Revelation 7. You got 7 Revelation? Got it? Okay, look at verse nine. We're talking about worship. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude, and no one could count from every nation. Isn't this beautiful? That's why we do missions. That's why Pastor Larry encourages us to go to the entire world with the gospel. Because God says, in my heaven, there's gonna be every nation, every tribe, people of every language standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb of God. And they're wearing white robes and holding up palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, Revelation 7, 9, and 10. We're gonna worship. Oh, here it is. This is what y'all, y'all thought I was making it up. We're gonna feast. We're gonna eat up in heaven. Come on. Sam's rubbing off on me. I got to get my own word. I'm too old to say, come on. Look at Matthew. Go to the first book of the New Testament. Matthew 26, 29. Matthew 26, 29 says, I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it, new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus is saying there's gonna be a party, there's gonna be a banquet, there's gonna be a feast, and every tribe and every tongue and every nation, every people and every person who know me are gonna join me at this amazing heavenly banquet, and we're gonna feast with God forever and ever and ever. You went some more, flip back to Revelation 19. I'm just reading the word. You can believe it or not, that's up to you. You choose, choose to believe. Revelation 19, seven. I like it when your pages flip. I'm not opposed to technology or the Bible on the phone, but I also like the leather bound copy. You got Revelation 19, look at seven. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen and bright and clean was given to her to wear. By the way, fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's people. When you stand before the Lord, he sees the acts of Thompson Station Church. He sees the vacation Bible school. He sees the hundreds of kids that know Christ. He sees the mission teams that go out three, three, four, and five teams this summer. He sees the giving that you give. He sees when you share the gospel with your neighbor. Those are the righteous acts that you're clothed in, that you're robed in. God sees that. God honors that. And then the angel said to me, verse nine, uh, Revelation 19, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. So we worship, so we feast. One, one more thing in heaven you may or may not know is we will serve, S-E-R-V-E. If we're gonna serve there, we need to serve here. Jump in and help us with Vacation Bible School. We need morning crew leaders. A few more. 
No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. Right there in your text. Sometimes people think heaven's gonna be a place with no activity. Think, oh, we're gonna be sitting around. All of us are gonna be chubby little angels. You don't ever become an angel. An angel's not lost or saved. An angel's in heaven. An angel is, is not like you. You're more important than angels. You know, you understand that, don't you? Jesus didn't die on the cross for angels. He died on the cross for you. And we're going to serve him in heaven. Heaven is, is not a place you sit around and do nothing. The heaven will be a great city, and it's described in detail. Read it in Revelation. It's full of activity and excitement. Things are going to be happening. The best worship service you've ever been in and multiplied a gazillion, quadrillion, bedillion times, whatever. Nothing compared, as, as great as our worship here is with Chip and the gang, listen, it's nothing compared to heaven. But we'll also feast and we'll also serve. Here's another thing. We will have a personal communion with God. Revelation 22, go over to Revelation 22, verse four. We will have personal communion with God. Think about that. It won't be blocked or hindered by our sin. You know, the Bible says, now we see through a glass dimly, a mirror dimly, because it's hazy. That haziness is the, is the sin of the world and the sin of our own personhood. But then it's clear. Nothing will interrupt your relationship with God. It'll be pure and perfect and personal. And they will see his face, verse four, and his name will be on their foreheads. We'll see his face, friends, clearly, not dimly. Remember, Moses couldn't see the face of God because his human body couldn't take it. So when he went by, what did God do? God took his hand and he, he put him under a cleft and God stopped him from seeing it. What he could see, he just saw a little glimpse of the backside of God. You couldn't see God now. I couldn't see God now, but then we can. We shall see God face to face on earth. No believer ever saw the face of God. In heaven, every believer will see the face of God. Think of that. Every believer will see the face of God. On earth, sometimes we slip away from God. In heaven, there's never any backsliding because there's not any sin. We have a personal communion with God. See, I, I, I want to end with this thought. No matter how heavy the burdens that you bear, or how difficult the decisions you face, or how threatening the circumstances that confront you. As believers, we have hope. We have hope because the greatest days of our lives and the greatest joys of our years and the greatest thrills of our souls are still ahead. Still ahead. This is how hope holds on. So on July the 4th, I turned three score, 60 years old, and thank you for all your birthday wishes. Thank you, Terry, for saying that on the platform so my phone blew up because you reminded everybody. Thank you. And Leanne, because it was a special, you're really getting old now present. She gave me an amazing present. And it was a secret as long as she could keep it. And my gift that she gave me for my 60th birthday is we went to the Zion National Park, highly recommended. And it's in southern Utah. And so we flew into Vegas and we drove, drove, drove. <laughs> Dixon coming out, see, the education wasn't so good. I told you, I tried to tell you. I'm trying to learn you something, but you don't listen. We flew into Vegas and drove a little over two hours to southern Utah, and we had an amazing time. The first day, we did two days in Zion, we did the trolleys. Great park system, no cars that block it up like some of the national parks. A trolley with nine stops. And we did some amazing hikes. If you go there, the best hike for me and for us was, uh, was, was the, the hike in the river, the Virgin River at the very end. It's called the Narrows. And we only went a couple miles in because I'm about five weeks out from knee surgery. So I was a little unstable. You're literally hiking in the creek. A lot of fun. And we did a few others. The second day... Never done this before. Leanne had a brilliant idea. We discovered e-bikes. Oh my gosh, e-bikes are amazing. Has anybody ever done an e-bike? Oh, electric bike. You pedal once and whoo, you take off. I said, this is my kind of biking. I told Leanne, she bikes all the time. She actually, I said, you buy me an e-bike and I'll ride with you. You pedal hard and I'll just coast along. 
So we went to stop to stop at our own pace, didn't have to wait on a trolley or get on a crowded trolley, just went from place to place. Highly love e-bikes. So I will show you a little bit um, of, of our trip. Look at this little video, and I ha we had to put this in. Ooh, look at me up there e-biking away, just piddle paddling. And this is Zion Valley. That's the Virgin River. And Leanne is uh, Leanne's just videoing behind me. See how easy that is? Get you an e-bike, praise God. Get you an e-bike. All right, look at this next picture. That's Leanne, and these, these are called the patriarchs. I love it because so much of this is Bible terms. The left, center, and right, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the, that's the patriarchs. Now, here, let's just one more picture here. And this is me with the Zion Valley behind me and the Virgin River that we hiked in one day. And this is on the trail to the pools, the Emerald Pools. There's three of them. Beautiful, beautiful handiwork of God. You know what I think of when I see that? The pictures don't do it justice. You know what I'm talking about? When I see the handiwork of God, when I see the matchless beauty of God on earth, I wonder how much greater the beauty of heaven will be. Because now I still just see all things dimly because I've got haziness in my eyes from my sin-stained heart. Though I'm forgiven, I still battle with it. Paul says, I don't do the things I want to do and I do the things I don't want to do. We still deal with it. But then it'll be perfect in heaven. When I see the majesty of God in creating all this, I, man, that God loves me. That gives me hope. That gives me hope. That God became a man and died for me. That gives me hope. That gives me hope. So we spent this time in Zion and we went Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday there. And then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we flew home late last night. I, I didn't get in bed till midnight. I, I told the guys, I said, make sure you got a big strong Celsius up in here for me today. So we spent three days with Steve and Nick and John and Emily. If you're new to TSC, that's our church planning team that we sent out to Las Vegas to plant a church and spent a lot of time with the Wits and a little time with the Labantes. And so Steve and Nikki, if, if you're not familiar with them, they're our church planners. We got to, Leanne does a, a weekly podcast, so go, go to wherever you get your podcast and put in Leanne McCoy, L-E-I-G-H-A-N-N, -N, and listen to this podcast with the wits as they tell their story. Amazing. So in, in January of 2016, Steve and Mariah, their youngest daughter, who was in eighth grade at the time, went because Marley, their oldest daughter, was a senior, didn't want to take her out halfway through her senior year. So Nikki and Marley stayed. And Mariah and Steve went to Vegas, moved in a neighborhood. Well, anybody who knows Steve Witt knows what he's going to do the second day he's in town. In his neighborhood, Steve and Mariah knocked on over 200 doors in the next few couple of three weeks and just saying, hey, I'm Steve, and I'm gonna start a Bible study on my, in my house, such and such a date. I think it was in March he had his first Bible study. And so knocked on 200 plus doors in his neighborhood, invited to come into his home for a Bible study. And that night, Steve told me and Leanne, that, that, and Steve and Nikki as we had the podcast, they set up the living room, they had the chairs, and they had the refreshments, they had the drinks, they're all ready. And man, oh man, they were excited. Two people showed up, two people. You knock on 200 doors and you get two people. Steve told us, he said, I thought a minute and I said, Lord, did I make a mistake? And then he went back and he said, no, God called me. You see, when God calls you, you hold on to that call and you hold on to the hope that what God started, he'll complete. You see, everything in your life isn't finished yet. And, and one of my favorite saying is, is, in the end, it all works out. And you say, well, Tom, it's not working out. And then I say to you, it's not the end. See, that's the way God works. He started with two people in his living room. Fast forward seven days later. We'll see what he does. But before we get there, look, look at a picture. They bought some property. And look at this picture of property. Leanne and I went out there in, uh, in May of 2021. And there, there, there's this rock lot that we helped pay for, by the way. And that's a rock lot. So it's just sitting there empty. They're still meeting in a storefront. Their worship area is thir was 30 feet deep and 80 feet wide. 
That's not very conducive with a low ceiling. So that's the first picture. In September, let's move forward now. September of this year, seventh year anniversary. And they have a beautiful building on the highway. So look at Steve right here in his worship center. And look at this, maximum occupancy. I love this. This is a 100% Steve with 423 plus one Holy Spirit. <laughs> Praise God for that. Now look at the exterior of their building. Absolutely gorgeous, the Well Church. Guys, you help pay for that. This sits on a highway six wide, six wide with 75,000 people within a four or five mile radius. And I took this in the rental car, Leanne's driving, because she doesn't trust my driving, moving down the highway, visibility to the maximum. When they, I told Steve a year ago, when you get in your building, you're gonna double within a year. They've gone from under 200 to right at 400 right now. Absolutely beautiful. And then this is inside the corridor, inside the vestibule, inside the welcome center. And it's there for everybody to see every single Sunday. Jesus is hope. Friends, Jesus is hope. So if you don't have Jesus today, come to Jesus. If, if you've kind of wandered away, come back to Jesus. Jesus is our hope. Hold on to hope. Hold on to Jesus. That's why our mission statement is connecting people with Jesus. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him so you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him that you may overflow with hope. Others need the hope that you have. Share it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you need a little encouragement today? Do you need a little hope today? Do you need a little partnership today, encouragement today? Hey, when you look up here, when you look up here, you don't, you don't get to know, we don't get to know all of you personally, but we deal with the same stuff you deal with. Our people that are great, trained in prayer, you know what? They're lovely and they're wonderful, but they're just mortal, just like you and me. But what we do is we help one another. That's why you need to be in community. That's why you need to be in a life group. Get in a life group, please. You need community. This morning, I'm gonna just ask you to stand right now. We're gonna to start to play. I'm gonna ask our prayer partners to come. Could we pray for you? Just a little encouragement, a little hope, whatever's in your life. Is there something we could pray with you and for you about right now? So prayer partners and staff, you come right now and we don't start singing and I'm just gonna say, invite you right now. If you just wanna to come to the altar and say, hey, Lord, it's been a while. I'm back, give me a little hope, give me a lot of hope. Lord, I just pray right now that you'd move in every heart at home, online, and here on campus in the worship center. Lord, come, move Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, amen. You come right now, who, who needs somebody? Anybody need a little encouragement? Don't you wait, thank you, I see you, come on. Anybody else, come on.